The French copy no one, and no one copies the French, except it would appear the Serbians. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we have the cool privilege of taking a look at a Zostva M93 Black Arrow. This is a 50 caliber anti-material rifle developed by Zostava in Serbia in the 1990s. Uh, and right off the bat I'd like to say a big thanks to Zostava USA for sending me this one to do some filming on and show to you guys. Now the concept here is, well, it began in the early 1990s, 1991 development began, uh, and that was when uh, Zostava was still known as the Red Flag Institute. And the concept was, well, an anti-material rifle. Something that could, well probably the best way to think about it is something that could be an alternate weapon for engaging what you would normally engage with an RPG. And so we're talking about things like, theoretically, low-flying aircraft, but more likely uh, small aircraft parked on the ground, uh, communications or surveillance type equipment on the ground, uh, think radio, hardware, satellite dishes, uh, light armoured vehicles, things like armoured personnel carriers or trucks or jeeps. And the idea, the plan, was that a 50 caliber bolt-action rifle could engage this sort of target to about the same range as an RPG could, but do it with much greater accuracy. RPGs don't, like, they have some accuracy issues at long range, uh, where this could be a much more effective weapon. Uh, this is of course a much heavier weapon than an RPG launcher, but the individual ammunition is much lighter and much smaller, and so you could also have a longer duration of engagement with troops that had a couple of these things as opposed to RPGs. I think the RPG comparison is a really interesting and enlightening way to consider the utility of an anti-material rifle. Now when this was originally developed it was chambered for the 12.7 by 108 millimeter cartridge. That is the Soviet 50 caliber. That was chosen because the Yugoslav at the time army had DSHK heavy machine guns mounted on a lot of their tanks. That, that machine gun uses the 50 uh, Soviet cartridge and so it would make sense that was in the inventory, we'll use that cartridge. Now production has expanded to both that cartridge and the 127 by 99 which is the 50 Browning cartridge. That's what this one is, the ones that have been imported into the US are all 50 Browning. Because the Browning cartridge is available here, the Soviet 12.7 Dishka cartridge is basically unavailable here. Uh, the rifle has a 33 inch barrel, it weighs in also at 33 pounds, that's like 16 kilos. Um, it's a little heavier in 12.7 Soviet at like 36 pounds. This is a hefty, heavy rifle, uh, just barely under six feet in overall length. So it's a lot of gun to carry around, but it fires a nice powerful cartridge. I have seen differing claims on exactly what the military testing of this rifle was. Um, it has been clearly used by the Serbian army and the Yugoslav army, but I'm not entirely sure what how, how that was formally acquired. Um, I have been told that it actually never passed formal military testing, and yet clearly they are in military service, so I don't know exactly what to tell you on that account. They were uh, used in some of the conflicts in the Balkans, and then they've also actually been sold commercially and seen use in a lot of recent small-scale conflicts in places like Yemen, Syria, um, Middle East, North Africa. So these guns are out there, they get around, um, in addition to just being part of the modern Serbian army. Now mechanically, mechanics are where I think this rifle gets really interesting. Uh, I was told by Zastava that this rifle was based on their M70 bolt action Mauser sporting rifle. And there, that's true as far as basically the front of the receiver and the locking lugs go, but the rest of this rifle is a copy of a French FRF1, which I think is a fascinatingly interesting uh, twist of events. So uh, I happen to have an actual FRF1 here. So we're going to bring the camera up close, I'll show you how the M93 was designed and what is and is not uh, taken off of the FRF1. All right, let's start at the back end of this beast of a gun and work our way forwards. First off, we have the shoulder stock. There is a bit of a uh, sort of soft recoil pad uh, on the buttstock. Uh, the rest of this is sort of a, is a hard plastic. 
allegedly there are recuperator springs in these two tubes that will absorb some of the recoil impact from firing, but I will tell you that I can't make those things compress. So if there are actually springs in there, they are extremely heavy springs. Uh, next up we have a basic pistol grip. Honestly, not the most comfortable thing I've ever handled. It's got some relatively sharp edges on it there. Moving forward to the trigger, we have a basic simple trigger. It is not adjustable in any way. The safety is simply a little uh, blocking bar that comes down behind it, which prevents you from pulling the trigger back. That safety was taken directly from the FRF1, which has exactly the same thing. Uh, and it was put on there because the FRF1 was largely derived from the MOS 36, which has no safety at all, and the French did want a safety on their sniper rifles, so they put in just a very simple safety like that, which Zastava copied. Alright, moving forward a bit, uh, we have, you can actually see the receiver markings here, We've got a carry handle we'll talk about in a moment, uh, but Zastava in Serbia and a serial number back here, and then markings added for US import, um, Zastava Arms USA, Deplane, read the owner's manual before using, etc, etc. Actually it is kind of interesting to look at the owner's manual, because at least part of it has clearly been translated from a Serbian military manual, um, because it gives you instructions on things like um, how to properly shoot the rifle from a trench position, which isn't the sort of thing you normally get in a commercial precision rifle manual. Anyway, uh, the gun comes with a pair of five round magazines with this rather unusual magazine release on the side. So that's got a spring under there, push that down, magazine comes out, that little slot is what locks the magazine in place. This is a double stack magazine, uh, unlike many of the 50 caliber rifles out there this is not a Barrett magazine, um, and is not compatible with Barrett magazines. Uh, holds five rounds, I have seen some complaint uh, from uh, soldiers in the field that these tend to drop out uh, in use, and I can kind of understand that. That's a relatively small locking catch for a magazine that's going to be holding a lot of ammo and undergoing significant recoil. In case you're curious about where that unusual magazine release comes from, well, it comes from the FRF1, right there. The French use this style basically because the FRF1 again is derived from the MOS 36 and to some extent the MOS 4956 series. Uh, the 4956 has side latching magazines because of its original design ancestors, which didn't have space for a rear mounted more traditional magazine release. At any rate, uh, in gentle with this, with the FRF1 as well, you push that down, lifts up the latch. On a 30 caliber magazine like this, that locking latch is uh, much larger relative to the mass and size of the magazine, and it holds the magazine just fine. I'm going to take the bolt out in a minute, but we're going to finish the rest of the, the outside of the rifle before we get to that. Uh, this is a relatively recent production M93, and it has just a big Picatinny rail that is screwed onto the top of the receiver. However, the early versions actually copied the FRF1 style of scope mounting, which was a basically a dovetail right here. Um, and a, it's a cool quick detach proprietary scope mounting system. It works quite well on the FRF1, uh, but it was not sufficiently uh, strong for a 50 caliber rifle. And so that was replaced by Zastava uh, at some point in, in production. I don't know if it was early or relatively recently, but it was replaced with just a standard Picatinny rail. They gave the M93 a big old carry handle, which is much appreciated. This is a heavy rifle, there's no particularly handy way to carry it, um, except this handle, which is nicely put at the balance point of the rifle, which by the way is right over the bipod. It's interesting, this will balance sitting right on its bipod legs, which is convenient in some ways. It's also not the greatest uh, for, say, absorbing recoil. Uh, but it does allow the shooter to traverse without moving the gun very much, so there are pros and cons to that. The carry handle, by the way, will only lift up horizontal, then it locks in place so that it doesn't hit a scope that you might have on there. The bipod legs here are fixed in place, this bipod doesn't come off. What you do is push this lever down, and then you can fold the bipod down, like so. Locks in place here. Um, there's no pivot, there's no swivel, there's no movement at all to the bipod. If you want to extend or retract the legs, you have a 
knurled, basically a locking screw here, and the leg itself is spring-loaded. So you can unscrew this and then let the leg extend or push it down to whatever position you want, and then tighten it back up. Perhaps you saw this coming by this point, but that bipod is taken straight from the FRF1, which also has no pivot or rotation. It has exactly the same style of bipod foot there, and the same style of unscrew. This, there we go, and then you can extend or retract the bipod legs, and then tighten them down to lock them in place. Guess what you're about to see next? FRF1 has this nifty flip-up detachable uh, emergency backup iron sight. Yep, so does the M93. That flips up there. You can see the screw right there. Uh, if you undo that you can actually take the rear iron sight off. They are detachable. Now on the M93 there are actually little tritium vials inserted, two back here and one on the front sight, uh, so that you have luminous uh, sights that you can use in the dark. That's something that the FRF1 did not do. And moving forward to the front sight, we have the same sort of thing. It folds down. Uh, this is, uh, frankly, that looks a little spindly to me for a 50 cal sight. I have also read accounts of the sights having some durability issues in the field, but um, this is also detachable. It has a screw right there, just like uh, the rear sight. It has a tritium vial in the center to give you a luminous dot at night. And of course it is, once again, taken directly from the FRF1. The muzzle brake here however is not copied from the French. Uh, the French, the FRF1, has a muzzle brake that can be adjusted uh, to basically match the vent holes in the flash hider with the lands and grooves of the rifling, which is cool and it's adjustable for accuracy. On the M93 Black Arrow What's more important is using the muzzle brake to actually control felt recoil because it is a massive rifle. So it has a big old two chamber uh, brake on it, and it is removable. So you'll notice this is a little bit loose. I can come in here, lift this pin up to unlock it, and then pull that pin out. And after quite a lot of threading, I can take that muzzle brake off. So if I want a different pattern, uh, or it needs to be repaired or anything like that. So that's a cool feature. Now let's take a look at the bolt. We have a long straight bolt handle with a nice perfectly round knob on it. Might look familiar. However, this has very much a Mauser style extractor and locking lugs at the front and a bolt release that is straight off of a Mauser. So lift that up, we can take our bolt out. And here is where we do have a fundamental difference between the FRF1 and the M93. So as I said, this is a Mauser style locking system. We have our two main locking lugs up here, safety lug back there, the extractor is this big long extractor on the side. The FRF1, like the MOS 36, actually has two rear mounted locking lugs, and it has an older style of extractor uh, that's simply dovetailed into the side of the bolt. However, the firing pin systems are identical. So to disassemble this we are going to push this pad in and rotate it 90 degrees, and then the rear plug comes out. There's our FRF1 rear plug. Then we have a firing pin spring. There's our FRF1 firing pin spring. Then we can take the firing pin and slide it out the back. There's our FRF1 firing pin. So Zostfa has copied the basically the front end of the bolt from Mauser, but then very much stuck with the FRF1 pattern for the back end of the bolt. Which is fine, this is actually a much simpler system than a Mauser bolt. It is equally reliable, it's equally effective. It's just a lot faster to disassemble, um, and a lot cheaper and easier to manufacture. Note that we have a pair of uh, gas vent holes here in case you have a ruptured cartridge, same as you've got on the FRF1. So there's the M93 bolt taken apart. 
Uh, one thing I will point out, there's a little feature right here, this sort of hook uh, on the back of the bolt plug. That is there, <laughs> this was added very early in MOS 36 development, uh, when it was realized that without that hook you could actually disassemble the bolt while it was locked in battery. You could take the bolt plug out, the spring and the firing pin could then fall out, and that was a problem. So this hook interacts with the receiver and prevents the bolt plug from rotating when the bolt is locked in battery in the gun. So that's definitely something that if you're going to copy the MOS 36 or the FRF1, uh, you want to take that feature as well. So there's the hook on the FRF1 plug. The M93 was originally issued uh, in the military with an 8x56, 8, 8 power by 56 millimeter uh, Zrock scope, which was not widely acclaimed. Um, basically it was a scaled up version of the scope that they had on rifles like the M76 snipers. Uh, fortunately the Picatinny rail today allows you to, anyone to mount any very good quality optic that they like. Zostava says uh, this will do 1.5 MOA with good quality ammunition, which I'm in no position to refute um, or substantiate. I am not a good enough shooter, um, and I haven't had a chance yet to take this out and do any sort of substantial shooting with it. So can't really comment on that. The question that remains to me that I was unable to find a good answer for is why the FRF1? Of all the things that could have been copied, and given that they chose to use the Mauser locking lug system anyway, where did the FRF1 influence come from? Um, Zastava was not willing to admit that this was in any way copied from the FRF1. They said this came from one of their uh, Mauser sporting rifle designs, so they aren't telling me. And I guess the FRF1 is an excellent uh, precision rifle. If you want to copy something, you're not really going to go wrong copying the FRF1. It just seems a rather unusual choice to pick, um, because as I said at the beginning, typically no one copies the French. But here we are. A small number of 50 BMG Browning machine gun uh, M93s were imported into the US in the early 2000s, so there have been a few of them floating around. However, Zastava USA brought in a more substantial batch uh, just last year in 2019, and so if you see them around and available now, that is the reason. Uh, they are, Zastava is eager and happy to make commercial sales, and so they brought some of these in uh, to uh, put on the market. Anyway, a uh, big thanks to Zastava USA for sending me over this one. I unfortunately have to return it, but not before I take it out to the range, which we are going to do tomorrow. So stick around, and uh, we'll see how this actually handles in some live fire. Thanks for watching.